this uh, tonight's recording is in progress now. <laughs> Uh, and tonight's presentation is going to be on jumping worms, the biology, history, and management. So first things first, uh, a little bit about earthworms. You probably know a little bit, uh, especially if you're a gardener. They are invertebrates, meaning that they don't have any backbones. They have no bones at all. They are segmented annelids. Um, so they basically eat decaying roots, things like leaves, bacteria, fungi, and they're typically found in the soil. Now, some earthworms you might be familiar with would be the red wiggler seen here on the right. Uh, you might be familiar with the black-headed worm or the nightcrawler, often called European nightcrawler or the comet nightcrawler. So before I dive into jumping worms, what I wanna talk about is earthworm biology. So where are the worms actually in the soil? And these are broken down into three classifications. So the first is epigeic. This is typically the leaf litter layer, uh, about one to three inches. So it's really on the top of the soil. And these are where our red wigglers would be found. The next is endergeic. This is our topsoil. This is about, about six to 10 inches. And these are things like leaf worms. And lastly, this is anisic. So this is the subsoil layer. And this is uh, this goes down quite deep, so up to um, six feet into the ground. And these are where our common night crawlers or our European night crawlers are going to be found. Uh, so three different classifications. Also important to note here that there are no native earthworms in the state of Maine. And this is because um, of this glaciation event that happened a long time ago. And so essentially most of the New England states, uh, New York included, were covered in this sheet of ice. And so any worms that were present in this area died because of the ice sheet. And then when everything thawed out, there were no worms left. Now, what ends up happening is that there's this expansion of the worms that were not covered by that ice sheet. And so we got that northward drift of all of these earthworms that were in the southern parts of the United States. And we also got introduction of different kinds of worms. And today's special guest, the jumping worm. So there's three species technically of jumping worms, um, and two of them are in the Amythus genus, and the last one is in the Metifier genus. And so what's important to note is that even though they're in different genuses, they more or less have the same characteristic. They might differ a little bit in the size, how thick they are, how long they get, um, but they're all going to be, you're going to be looking for the same things uh, to try to identify these worms. They are also known as crazy worms, snake worms. I've heard Georgia jumpers and Alabama jumpers. So if you see any of that online, um, they are referring to the jumping worms, which is what we're talking about today. Jumping worms are native to Eastern Asia, which means that they are non-native to the United States. Uh, essentially, like I said, there's no native earthworms in the state of Maine uh, or in New England and a lot of parts of the United States. Um, these ones are also invasive. And so invasive in this sort of definition means that they're not from Maine, they're not from the United States, and they cause some kind of ecological damage of some sort. So non-native and invasive. So jumping back a little bit here to the earthworm biology, where would we find jumping worms? And this is uh, going to be that first layer, the first thing that we talked about. So this is the epigeic layer. So one to three inches into the soil. Um, I have here two inches, it just depends on what you got going on. Um, but this is really, really important to understand where the jumping worms are in the soil layer when we talk about their life cycle. So how long do they live? Where can we find them? These jumping worms are very unique in that they only live for about one year, which is very different than uh, the common earthworm, which a lot of folks have a lot of knowledge about. Common earthworms can live eight, nine, even 10 years, I've, I've heard. Um, and that's because they burrow so far into the soil. So they can protect themselves from things like frost and snow and all the kinds of things that would dry them out or kill them otherwise. Now, jumping worms are found in the couple, the top few inches of the soil layer. So that's not gonna be the case for jumping worms. They only live a year because they will die right around this time, uh, typically mid, late October, when we get that first hard frost. So all of the adult jumping worms uh, that might be in your garden or in your forest or maybe some that you've seen will be dead in the coming weeks. Hooray. But the problem with this is that they throw all of their energy into growing really, really fast. So they start off hatching out of their eggs in May, June. They become juvenile worms. They keep eating. 
they get reproductive, um, uh, they are available for reproduction fairly soon uh, comparatively to the common nightcrawler. So they can prevent, um, excuse me, they can provide offspring in about July. And this is really problematic because they get to eat really fast, they reproduce, and then they can sometimes even do this twice a year uh, where they will grow up and then they will reproduce. Uh, so you can sometimes have more than one generation in a year. Um, all of them will still die in October, but again, this is sort of problematic because they can reproduce and throw out a whole bunch of offspring in a pretty short period of time. Um, the other problem with this is that they're what is referred to as parthenogenetic. And so essentially this word just means that they can reproduce on their own. They do not need a mate. They can just basically clone themselves and then create an entire new population. Um, so you can imagine this is fairly problematic. So if we're looking at the life cycle chart on the right here, we've got our juveniles in May, June, and we have our adults July through October. Again, they're dying at that first frost. And then they still exist in the soil as eggs inside of the cocoons, which are shown here in the, in the chart. And I have September on October here circled uh, in red because this is the time of year that they're really easy to identify um, because they have the reproductive structure that's called the clitellum. And I'll get to that in a little bit. But um, when you're looking at worms in your garden or in your woods or on your property and they don't have the clitellum, uh, they're juvenile, they're sort of hard to tell the difference. So I'll get into that uh, in just a few slides here. So more on the life cycle, they overwinter as eggs inside the small cocoons. And we can see an image of the cocoons here on the right uh, compared to a penny. So they're really small. And if you notice, they sort of just look like a clump of dirt. So they are very easy to miss as well. They are wrapped in a silk layer. So they're protected from things like drought or really, really cold temperatures. And again, like I had mentioned, they're really hard to detect. And as you can imagine, easy to spread if you don't know what you're looking for, which is challenging. So what are you looking for? How can I figure out if I have worms in my property? What can I do? So uh, before I get into jumping worms, what I want to talk about is common earthworm biology. So this is just going over other worms that you might see in your garden um, or in your forest. So common nightcrawler, European nightcrawler, they can get to about the same length as jumping worms. So this is about two to six inches long. And most importantly here, the structure we're going to be looking for is called the clitellum, which is this structure here. Hopefully you can see my, my laser pointer. Um, this is called the clitellum. So this is saddle shaped, meaning that this structure does not meet all the way around. Uh, there's sort of a gap in between here. So this is a saddle shaped clitellum. Um, on common night crawlers, it's also raised and it's in the middle of the body. So if we're looking at the full worm here, um, it occurs right around the middle. If you want to be really specific, it can occur anywhere from the segment 32 to 37. Um, and, and a segment just means like one, one little layer here. Um, also, what we're looking for in a, in a regular earthworm night crawler is widely paired seti, which are just hairs. Um, they're widely paired, just meaning that there's two of them, and um, they're, they're widely spread apart here. So there's not a whole lot of them. Okay, this can be seen if you've got something like a, a hand lens. Um, oftentimes, this is sort of a hard thing to tell. So really, we're going to be looking for the clitellum. Um, and basically, just an uh, important difference here is that the common night crawlers are slow moving and they're often really shy. So they're not thrashing around. While they can be kind of speedy, um, the behavior between these and the jumping worms is much different. Uh, oh, and here's a, an actual uh, image of the European night crawlers. So this, these are the little hairs that I was talking about. Very, very, very small. Um, you can sort of see them with the naked eye, but if you had a hand lens, you'd be able to tell. Um, so just an important difference if it, if it doesn't have a clitellum. So jumping worms. Again, the word of the night here, clitellum. That's really what we're looking for. And so for a jumping worm to be a jumping worm, uh, this is automatically what we're going to be looking for to try to help you identify what's going on. So we're looking for smooth and flat, not raised. Um, it's often milky white. Sometimes it can be a little on the gray side and it fully encircles the worm. So there's no saddleness. There's, there's um, no space, no gap that we were seeing with the European nightcrawler. It's fully encircled um, and it's closer to the head. So whereas if we're looking at 
the common earthworm, this is around the middle of the body. And again, we have that saddle shape for the clitellum. Jumping worms all the way around the clitellum and much closer to the head. And so um, I actually would recommend counting the segments if you can. This is going to be on segments 14 to 16 typically. Um, and this is important to count them or at least try to get a good guess here because when they stretch out their, their heads and their necks like that, Sometimes it may look like the clitellum's in the middle of the body, but it's really important to count those segments and you can sort of see when it's in the middle of the body or when it's not. So this is um, be all end all almost, checking the clitellum. The second thing that you can do here is again, checking those hairs. And so for jumping worms, they have a whole lot of them. So this is bristle-like. So there's no widely paredness uh, where we saw it in the common jumping worm. These are bristles all the way around. So we're seeing fully, fully engulfed bristles um, for the, each of the segments. And um, this is helping with locomotion. So they have so many of these bristles because they thrash around, they move about um, really rapidly. They don't actually jump, but the more hairs that they have, the better able they are to move, um, crawl up, et cetera, et cetera. So speaking of thrashing around, um, you can also check out their behavior. And so, although, like I said before, the common night crawlers can move really fast, they often don't, but they will if they are startled or disrupted in some way. Jumping worms are always, in my experience, going to be thrashing around like this, and they have a very specific serpentine locomotion where essentially they take their nose and their tail and they touch. So when you have it in your hand and you're looking, they'll kind of do this flipping motion and then they'll flip right off your hand. So they don't have hind legs or anything like that. They can't actually jump, um, but they will wiggle really quite fast um, off of your hand or out of the way when they're being disturbed. So another thing you can look for here is this thrashing, fast moving behavior. And lastly, um, sometimes jumping worms will drop their tail. And this is important to note that um, there are some other common earthworm species that will drop their tail. Although this is much more um, unlikely to happen in the common earthworm species, uh, jumping worms typically drop their tail more readily. So could be another thing to check out. So where are jumping worms? Uh, they can be found in soil, leaves, compost, mulch garden beds, crop beds. Um, I found them in forest settings as well, newly disturbed areas, that kind of thing. Um, so they really can thrive in a lot of different types of environments. As far as where they are, where they can be, they are currently expanding into areas around the globe. This includes North America, Central America, Europe, and Maine. And so if we're looking at this chart here on the right, I do wanna note that this is a little on the older side. So this was published in 2017, uh, which was a couple of years ago, but I think it paints a really important picture here. And so if we're looking at the dark gray color, uh, which pretty much covers all of Maine, except for a little tiny bit, um, and most of the United States, this is potential range. So this is habitats that jumping worms um, are suspected to be able to thrive in. And so we can see a lot of the states covered and we have the uh, white circles here indicating confirmed areas of where jumping worms have been found. Now, again, this is a little outdated. Uh, we've got it, uh, we're working on an updated version of this. So there should be a little bit more of the confirmation dots uh, on the state of Maine, unfortunately, but I thought this gave a really good overview of where they could be. So speaking of where they are specifically in Maine, um, again, this chart's a, a bit outdated. This was updated from last year's data um, earlier this year in January. And so we are coming toward the end of the season for jumping worms. Um, again, we're just waiting for that hard frost. And so we're still getting some reports of jumping worms. Um, and so we will have an updated version of this at some point soon on our website that you can check out, but this is the one for last year. So they were first found in the state uh, around 2014 and they are now confirmed in 13 of the 16 counties. So they are not currently, um, or we don't have any reports of them occurring in uh, Piscataquis, Aroostook or Washington counties. Uh, the last time I gave this presentation was, I think, two months ago, uh, give or take. And at that time, I had said that they were not considered to be widespread. Um, they are now considered to be widespread, uh, just based off the public reports that we have received of jumping worms. So 
unfortunately they are widespread, um, but there's, um, and there seems to be a bit of expanding here, but um, if you have jumping worms, try not to be alarmed. It seems like that's where we're heading. So how did they get here? Uh, they were likely imported on some kind of plant or other agricultural materials, um, whether intentionally or accidentally, it could be a little bit of both. But I will say that they are often accidentally introduced to new areas now that they're here. Uh, they can be spread in things like community mulch piles, plant nurseries, composts, uh, even your hiking boots or gardening tools, things like that. Um, and we'll get into why in just a second. That's because of the cocoons. So arguably, even though the worms can be really destructive and are destructive themselves, cocoons are the ones that are really secretive. They are what is allowing these worms to spread. And that's because they're really difficult to see. Um, so if you're walking somewhere that is infested with jumping worms and you have hiking boots that have a very big grip on them, uh, or tread rather, you're stepping on clumps of dirt and maybe one of those clumps of dirt has a cocoon that's just stuck in your hiking boot. You go hiking, you take your shoes off, you go to the next place. Um, you're potentially bringing those cocoons with you and introducing a new species. And again, they're parthenogenetic. So it only takes one egg, one viable egg to hatch and create jumping worms in some new area. Um, so as far as the species differ differentiation here, they are a little bit different in size if we're looking at the ruler on, on the left side of the screen here, but more or less, they look like a clump of dirt. They are really, really difficult to tell from the naked eye. Um, I would almost say impossible, really, really challenging. Um, like I mentioned before, they are resistant to cold seasons in the state. So if you're hoping that our, our hardy Maine winters is going to kill the cocoons, Unfortunately, that's just not going to be the case. Um, a lot of times, even though they are on the top couple of inches of the soil, what ends up happening is that there's a leaf litter layer or snow that's really insulative. Uh, so any kind of cold temperatures that might have some kind of interference with these cocoons likely is not going to kill them. And the last sort of issue with cocoons is this concept called seed banking. And so essentially what this means is that in a given area, if there's a whole lot of cocoons all about, not all of them are going to hatch in the same year at the same time. Um, and so this means that you might be able to, let's say you wipe out all of the jumping worm populations um, and most of the cocoons that you think. And so maybe you have a year, there's no jumping worms, which is unlikely, but let's say that happens. Uh, the next year, even if there was no active adult worms there, you might still have jumping worms because some of those cocoons decided to hatch. So there's sort of this um, overlapping generation issue as well. So something to keep in mind. And so you might be thinking, well, I thought of worms are good. They do all these things for my garden or for this, the soil. They keep it fertile. They keep it moist. Um, and I think there are good things about earthworms, um, even though that they are invasive um, and they are non-native. But I'd like you to try and open your mind uh, to have a different perspective about how they might be interacting with our forests. So I am sure you've seen the headlines. There are so many of them. Um, look out for jumping worms. Um, there's so much going on. Here's what you need to know. Uh, you know how the media is nowadays, it, changing the world, damaging, th threatening our forests, uh, ecosystems. And while this is a, sort of warranted, we just simply don't know. We just don't know. We are still learning. This is still a really, really new issue, uh, especially in the state of Maine. So. There's a lot of answers we we don't have uh, to great questions. Um, and it's just going to take some time for research to catch up with what we want to know. Uh, so even though they're getting a lot of attention, um, they might have some good, they might have some bad. Uh, everything I'm about to speak on is hypothetical uh, and just sort of meant to educate, okay? So try not to panic here. We're just doing our best to stay informed. So what do they do? Why are they a problem? Why do people care so much? And the biggest problem is that they change the soil consistency. Um, so you can see here in these images, they turn the soil into what I've heard, um, coffee grounds, grape nuts, cereal, uh, nerds, candy, um, not good. Uh, and so this really makes it dry and loose. And so this is problematic um, because it leads to things like erosion, and we don't want dry soil for our plants or for our trees. That can be really stressful for them. 
And ultimately, it will also result in less nutrient-rich soil as well. And so if we're thinking about loose soil, um, this is because if it's loose, there's, there's just, again, on the top couple of inches here, it's just a whole bunch of casings, which is just a fancy word for worm poop. Um, they wash away really easily. And so if you have a big rainstorm that comes in, it'll just take the soil right on down with it. So all those casings are leaving that area um, and exposing all of the roots. Um, in this case, I, I was at a site visit here and this tree um, had jumping worms surrounding it. So we can see these exposed roots, which stressful for the tree, not super great for, the, for any plants that would have been in that area. Again, because we're exposing those roots and causing a lot of stress um, in these areas. Another issue that can happen is that the soil can become compacted over time uh, once that, that top layer leaves. And so um, this will also limit movement of water, air, nutrients, things that plants and trees like to survive. And so again, this is sort of compounding over time. Um, we might start to see issues like this. Uh, so you might be thinking, okay, well, red wigglers have really nutrient risk ca uh, castings, and that's true. Um, but the problem with jumping worm casings, even though that they can be nutrient rich, is that they're on the top of the soil because of where the worms live. And so they are no longer accessible. All those nutrients that are on the top of the soil are no longer accessible to the plant roots uh, or the tree roots that they normally would have been if jumping worms were not there, um, just based on how this species functions. What can also happen is that the fungus root relationships that a lot of plants and trees really need to thrive um, are also dysregulated because of the change in the soil consistency. Um, so sort of the same story here. This is just a, a different way of looking at it. Um, on the left, we have lightly infested and on the right, we have heavily infested. So if we're looking at the left side, we have plant diversity, we have healthy leaf layer, uh, we've got nice thick and spongy soils. Um, and when we have a lot of jumping worms in an area, what ends up happening is, is that top soil will wash away. We have exposed roots. We have a lot of our native plants that might not be um, super loving the exposed roots. They can't get deeply rooted into the soil. They might end up dying. Um, so we're losing all of these good things that make our ecosystems really diverse and healthy. And if we're thinking about our plant diversity, if we have a lot of plants that are really happy and healthy, and there's a whole lot of them, that means that they're bringing in a whole lot of insects that are going to love those plants. Um, and insects are a really good food source for things like birds. And so if we lose the plant diversity because jumping worms are making uh, certain soils inhabitable for our native species, we might be losing our native insects or our pollinators as well. And so if we have an area that has increased forest damage, so something like uh, drought or jumping worms in this case, we might also start to see an increase in invasive plant presence. So things like garlic mustard or Japanese barberry, glossy buckthorn, all things that are invasive uh, plants that we don't necessarily want in our forests, they might thrive in areas where uh, the soil has been disrupted and no longer have any competition. Um, if our native plants are dying or they're stressed, these invasive plants are typically able to withstand that kind of stress and thrive. Um, so they will absolutely outcompete any of our native species. One thing I do want to mention as um, a hypothetical, again, we're just looking at the research here and formulating ideas about what might happen. I have a little red star on Japanese barberry, and that's because Japanese barberry creates a really good microclimate for black-legged ticks. And so if we have an environment where um, there's a lot of Japanese barberry, uh, because of the jumping worms soil, Japanese barberry is really thriving. There might be an opportunity for ticks to thrive as well. So we might start to see things like increased Lyme disease incidences. Again, hypothetical, uh, but something that might happen as a result of the changed soil. Uh, so if you're thinking maybe they were good, well, they're an invasive species. They can upset the soil chemistry and the nutrients in that soil. They can make it more difficult for our native plants and trees um, and our insects and our wildlife to thrive and ultimately they have the potential to damage forests. So how can we stop this from happening? As sometimes it's already here and that's okay, but how can we prevent it from going further? So number one here, arrive clean, leave clean. So we're making sure that we're cleaning our, um, our soil and debris from our vehicles, our equipment, our boots as a big one, if we're going hiking and things like that. Um, I highly recommend investing in a boot brush 
uh, they're relatively affordable, Amazon or any kind of um, big box store. And you just scrape your shoe on it and it'll remove any of those clumps of dirt that might have cocoons on it. Uh, and this is especially important if you are going somewhere that has or had jumping worms. Again, we don't wanna be traveling with cocoons um, in, our, in our hiking boots unintentionally. So for gardening, it's sort of the same kind of story where we wanna be cleaning our gardening tools before moving to and from sites. Um, if you have landscapers coming to your property or if you have logging work that's being done on your property, um, you can always ask them to clean their equipment so that they are not unintentionally bringing in um, potential uh, clumps of cocoons on their equipment uh, onto your property. Another thing you can do here is rinsing the roots to remove any of those soil clumps, because again, that's where the cocoons might be. Um, so what you can do here is if you place the soil clumps um, in a trash bag in the sun, you can um, let the solar rise, the sun will kill any of the cocoons that are that will be washed off from those plants, um, then you can throw them out. Uh, more prevention here, don't purchase jumping worms for a comp any kind of composting, gardening, fishing bait. Um, I've been told that they uh, don't even make good bait because they wiggle so much, they just wiggle right off the hook. Um, and I've also read that fish don't even particularly care for them. So, um, don't buy them for, for bait. Um, please don't discard any live worms in the wild. Um, and if you can teach others about jumping worms, that's also really, really important. Sort of related to gardening here, um, if you do have jumping worms, um, don't discard infested yard waste in the woods. We certainly don't want the jumping worms to go into the woods of your property. It'll have far more complications. Um, other things that we can we can do is just uh, provide education for ourselves and for our community around us. And so knowing the signs of jumping worms, uh, knowing their life cycle, when they might be around, knowing what the soil might look like if there's jumping worms, um, these kinds of things are all really helpful to try to find a solution here. One thing you can do is monitor for jumping worms. If you have a really heavily infested area, um, sometimes if you just kick the leaf layer, they will just be on the surface. And I know folks that might have jumping worms, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, they are very active. Um, if you have a lighter infestation, what you can do is a mustard solution, which I will actually talk about in uh, just a bit here. So other things, uh, just being a worm wise buyer is really important. So we're checking the soil and we're checking compost and mulch for signs of jumping worms or cocoons. Um, what you can also do is ask plant nurseries if they heat treat their soil or their compost or their mulch. And so um, if you are a person who buys bag mulch, um, just make sure it's it's heat treated. And if you can't buy bag mulch or you don't care to buy bag mulch, uh, you want to buy loose mulch or something like that, that's okay too. But I would have a conversation with the nursery or the person you're buying it from to see if they do heat treat. And if they don't heat treat, um, I would make an informed decision about whether or not you want to use that compost or that mulch. And lastly here, choosing bare root plants over potted plants when possible is going to be really important in, again, preventing the cocoons from unknowingly spreading. Um, and if you can't choose bare root plants, that's okay. It might be a, a wise idea to clean off the roots before you plant it. So if you put them into a bucket and you rinse, uh, rinse off all of the roots, you can either sift out uh, or take the soil that's in that bucket that came off the roots, again, throw it into a trash bag, into the sun, uh, solarize it, and um, that will kill any of the cocoons inside. And I'll talk about solarization in a, in a moment here as well. Um, so this is another option as, as well. If you think you might have jumping worms, uh, you can always report the suspected jumping worms to us. In fact, I highly encourage that. You go to the uh, Maine Department Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry website, you type in jumping worms. This is our webpage that will auto-populate, and we've got the report form uh, right on the right-hand side underneath the featured link. So if you're not sure, um, this is a great way to just get it on the map for us so that we can understand where they are expanding in the state and then get a good current understanding of where we think they currently are. If you think that you uh, obtained worms from a compost or potted plants or a nursery or anything like that, um, please reach out to the location you think you might have purchased them from. And you can also reach out to Gary Fish. He is our main state horticulturalist. Um, he's also on this call. I can't see the chat. I see it going off. 
So maybe he's in the chat answering questions. I'm not sure, but um, Gary is fantastic and a, and a great source. Um, Gary so, is all so, over the chat. Oh, thank you so much, Gary. <laughs> so um, he is an excellent resource. Um, so if you're wondering who that person is in the chat, it is Gary, and he's great. Um, other things, yeah, send in us a report, try not to panic. I know that it's a really frustrating thing to have jumping worms in your garden uh, or on your property, but we're really going to just focus on preventing their spread and doing what we can to manage. So speaking of management, it's really tricky. Uh, there's still so much that we don't know and we're still learning so much. So research is ongoing. Uh, and I know this is a really, this is the worst part uh, of the presentation for me because I like giving people really structured answers for how to solve their problem. But unfortunately, we just don't, we just don't know. Uh, one thing that I do want to mention here is that um, the shred of hope I will give you is that jumping worms are parthenogenetic. So again, they are cloning themselves. And so this means that they have relatively low genetic diversity. And so what does that mean? Basically, if I was a worm, let's say, I'm not obviously, but let's say that I was, and I have had some kind of peanut allergy. If I clone myself, my offspring will also have that peanut allergy, right? And then my offspring's offspring will also have that peanut allergy, okay? Right? Because we are all clones pretty much of, of one another. And so if this is the population that's going on in my yard, I've got all of these worms, then scientists might be able to figure out that, oh, hey, these worms have peanut allergies. Maybe we'll throw some peanuts into the soil and then they will all be, so they will also come to the peanuts, right? Or they'll be affected by the peanuts, the population will crash. Uh, so although there's no such thing as a peanut allergy and peanuts aren't gonna help uh, kill the worms as we know it, this sort of idea of if, you know, it's like the weakest link, one thing that'll kill one worm because of their genetic relation with another will also kill all of the other worms in that area. So I'm hopeful we'll be able to find something soon. That being said, we don't have anything. Um, but this is sort of my, uh, my my gleam of light here. So like I said, for chemical treatments, there's currently no products listed for use for management. Um, using products for pests that are that's not listed on the label is illegal, so I cannot recommend doing that. Um, but again, with the hope that we do have research, uh, we've got a bunch of people working on solutions on this, um, research is ongoing, I'm hopeful that we'll have an answer hopefully soon. Uh, so in the meantime, what can you do? What has been shown to be effective? And this is what I've been talking about for a couple of slides here. This is solarization. And so there's the idea that we are using the sun to basically cleanse all of our soils or our mulch or our compost. And so we know that the worms themselves will die if they reach temperatures of about 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and the worms and cocoons will die if some some area of the soil will reach about 104 days. Importantly, it needs to be for more than just one day. It needs to be at least at a minimum three, okay? So um, how do we actually achieve this? And this is what we call a solarization package. So what you can do is you can lay out uh, a tarp that you've got on hand, and you can make a thin layer of whatever you've got infested, let's say it's soil, okay? So you wanna lay out a depth of about six to eight inches on that first tarp, but you don't wanna lay it out all the way to the edges. You just wanna put it in the middle, even flat layer. Then you're gonna take something like a clear plastic painter's drop cloth, put that over it, and you're gonna make the package with these two. So you're basically going to sandwich them together. And so you can tuck the top sheet of the plastic underneath the soil, and then take the outer edges of the bottom one and wrap it over like a little, like a little present. Uh, you want to tape those together. However you want to do this, you just want to make sure that um, whether you secure them with rocks or you use tape, or if you've, you're an origami person, I don't know, you just want to make sure that the worms are not escaping from the tarp. Because if it gets really hot, which is what we want, and they have a way out, they will leave. Uh, and then you'll make this beautiful present and it won't be effective. So whatever you do to try to solarize, you need to contain the worms. Otherwise, they will just go to somewhere cooler and they will not die. Uh, the cocoons obviously can't move, so um, you'll kill those, but we want to kill as much as we can. So um, again, if this is the method that you are interested in, just make sure that we're securing it so that the worms can't escape. 
so you really want for this to work really well, this is only effective in the late spring, summer. Oh, we're in Maine, it doesn't get hot all of the time. So you unfortunately can't do it right now. Um, but this might be something that you uh, keep in your back pocket for next year. So it can be effective, it can work really well. Um, again, we can't get rid of all of them. They are here. They're unfortunately not gonna go anywhere. At this point in time, we're just trying to keep the population low and we're trying to learn how to live with what is still going to be there. Um, so again, we're leaving that out for a couple of days in full sun, if we can, that would be the best to get the temperatures up. Um, and we're doing this in late spring, summertime. Another option here, uh, way more labor intensive, but you can hand remove the worms. Uh, so same kind of thing here, uh, if you've got like a raised garden bed or something like that, or it's it's a relatively smaller um, soil that you have infested with these worms. Uh, some folks like to really feel like they're doing something and you know take the worms out, throw them in a, a soapy bucket of water, will kill them um, or throw them into a bag. And again, we're leaving that bag out in the sun um, in the summertime to solarize the contents and they will die. And you could just throw the bag out. Um, but this is really only effective for smaller infestations. And again, we are not uh, we are not going to be able to physically pull out every single worm. Um, and we certainly can't see the cocoons either. So this is really just um, small, smaller infestations here that might be effective at reducing some of the populations. What's the state doing? Um, unfortunately, jumping worms right now are not a regulated invasive species in Maine. So uh, the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, Forestry can't take action besides educating people um, and things like this, uh, outreach events. Uh, however, we are working with uh, multi-agencies. Uh, we've got a working group with a whole bunch of cooperators from a bunch of different universities that are conducting research on this, and we're inviting conversations, and we're trying to figure out what we can do, how to improve outreach, and how to improve public education um, in the meantime until we have better answers. Uh, so something that I have been doing um, uh, the past couple of months is a surveillance study. And this is what I was talking about before using the mustard. Uh, so this is a mustard pour. And um, this is a novel. I did not create this. This has been going on for uh, a number of years now. Um, but essentially, you take ground mustard and you put it in a gallon container of water. You shake it up really good so that the ground mustard dissolves. And you move the leaf litter layer off and you can pour this right onto the soil. Now, what will happen if you have jumping worms or often any kind of worm that's in that soil, the worms will immediately flood to the top. Um, it takes 10 seconds, it's very fast. Uh, and that's because there's chemicals in the actual ground mustard that are really irritating to the mucous membrane on the worms. So they will immediately crawl to the surface because they're really irritated uh, with the mustard you just poured on them. And this isn't gonna kill them, it's just going to annoy them so that they come to the surface and it'll help you identify them. Or if you are choosing to hand remove them, uh, it's an easy way to just pick them up out of the soil, drop them into a soapy bucket of water or a bag, kill them. Um, oftentimes mustard solutions are not going to be harmful for plants or trees or anything like that, but uh, you know your garden best. So if you have plants that are really sensitive to pH level changes or anything like that, um, this might not be the best way to um, tell if you have jumping worms for you. Again. I trust you all uh, to know what your gardens are going to tolerate and what they're not. So use this um, to your best judgment. But I did this uh, across the state. I really focused on the counties where jumping worms weren't. So again, Piscataquis, Aroostook County, and um, Washington County, and uh, really tried to find places where jumping worms might be. So again, unknowingly, you know, maybe somebody's got cocoons stuck in their hiking boots, or maybe we bought uh, jumping worms for fishing and then we discarded them. So things like boat launches or hiking trails, uh, fishing spots is really what I prioritized my time in. Um, and so coming up on the end of the season, so I'll probably have uh, something on our webpage about this later, but we're really just trying to understand where they are in the state um, because we, we don't have a great understanding of that right now. And we know that we are likely missing some areas. Uh, so this was a whole bunch of information, a whole lot that I just threw at you. Um, there's even more good resources on our webpage. Um, again, we have the report form on the featured links uh, on the right side of this page, uh, but there's other links from the extension and uh, other cooperators on there that have excellent resources, great graphics um, that are accessible if you are interested. And I do want to mention again, we will be updating um, this graph here on the left. So 
stay tuned for that. Check our website for <laughs> updates on that. Um, and with that, um, ending right on time. Look at me. Sorry, that was a lot of information. I've been talking for a long time. So um, I want to thank you again for attending uh, our, our lecture tonight. Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, if you have a smartphone and you're interested in looking at what our report form looks like, this is a QR code. So you can actually just open up your camera app and hover over and it'll auto-populate. And if you haven't reported jumping worms and you think you might have them, this might be a good opportunity for you to do that. Um, and with that, um, I'm assuming maybe there's questions left over. <laughs> I don't really know, but I'll stop talking and I'll let Emily take over. Thank you so much, Brittany. And thank you for everyone uh, who's been who's been with us. Um, it was incredibly helpful. There has been a very active chat of questions and Gary Fish has been answering a lot of them. I pulled out some major ones that I think people would appreciate hearing uh, either Brittany, you or Gary, whoever would like to answer them out loud for everyone. And I'll encourage people to continue dropping questions into the chat. I will download this afterward and send it out like with the recording. So don't try to speed read this whole thing. Um, I'll ask a few out loud and then uh, continue to uh, engage. This has been really, really productive already. Um, so uh, the first question I, I, I'm i curious about, and we had a small answer, but I'd love your perspective. Why are so many people finding jumping worms this year in Maine? Yeah, so it's a great question and probably one that we don't have a lot of great answers to. Um, I was reading some theories because this is not just unique to Maine, um, that when COVID hit, there was a lot of people who decided that they were really gonna focus on gardening. Um, so there was a lot of influx in plants and compost and things like that. Um, and jumping worms were around, but we didn't really, they weren't as much of a problem. And so I think that there could have been, again, speculation, but there could have been a lot of opportunities for the cocoons and the worms themselves to go unnoticed during this time. Um, the other half of the issue here is that they can, they reproduce so fast. So if there is a, a smaller population in an area and the next year you're seeing all of these worms, it re really happens so fast. Uh, and so unintentionally you could be spreading them to different areas. And so we're just seeing them spread and spread and spread. Media is a, another good answer to that question. I think more people are aware of what jumping worms are now than maybe they were a couple of years ago. So um, there's sort of this maybe false influx of reports um, they've they've maybe been there for years, but we know what they are now and we know to report them. So that might also explain why folks are seeing them more. But yeah, certainly uh, it's not just uh, in Maine and it's certainly not just in uh, Kennebec County either. Yeah, I would say that it has a lot to do with the rainy season that we've had, that we've had a bunch of really dry summers and probably people had jumping worms all along. They just never saw them. And this year we had the perfect storm of weather for them. And like like Brittany said, they reproduce very quickly. So a lot of people found hundreds of them. Thank you. And building on that, are there any lessons we can learn from places that have had jumping worms for years uh, with, with major infestations or in their native regions? Yeah, great question. Uh, so in the United States, I know that the University of Wisconsin has had them for a number of years, and so they would be a, re a better resource for long-term effects. That being Thank said, you. it's still relatively new to everyone. Um, it's it's still a relatively new thing. So um, we, we don't have a lot of great answers as to how they are going to impact our forests in the long term. Um, and in areas where they are native, um, they have other things to keep jumping worms in check. They sort of grew up, they evolved with other predators and species. And so um, sometimes jumping worms where they grew up in their native regions um, were outcompeted by other worms or other, other plants. And it's not a problem there because again, there was predators to eat them and keep their populations low. Uh, whereas here they're invasive, they're not native. Our birds, our, our snakes, our, you know, all of our animals here and our plants and, and trees don't necessarily know how to interact with the worms in the same way. So uh, oftentimes invasive species are not a problem where they are native, but they are a problem when they are non-native because we don't have anything to keep them under control. So we're going into the winter. So I'm curious, since solarization is not an option, um, are there steps that people can take right now going into the winter knowing that there's cocoons or maybe even adults 
in their garden, would you recommend removing the adults? What would you say before we get those high spring temperatures in a few months, many months? Many months, yeah. I think it, I think it really, I think it depends. Um, so as far as what the worms are doing right now, I was just out last week um, and again, we haven't had our, a hard frost yet. So the adult worms uh, in the sites that I were, were very much active. They were unfazed. Um, sluggish, a little sluggish, but still alive, still doing their thing. Um, and so if this is sort of the situation that you have going on in a raised garden bed or uh, in a compost or something like that, and you want to hand remove them, or if you want to mustard pour and take out as many as you can, I know some folks uh, really like that. And they say that, that it's made a difference. Um, and I think that it can. But again, if you're looking at infestations where you can have buckets of these worms, hand removal is probably not going to be worth your time. No. It's it's simply not. Um, and knowing that they are going to die uh, in a couple of weeks anyway, uh, might not be worth your time. Um, so it's really up to the amount of time and energy you want to put into hand removing them. Uh, it's certainly an option, but uh, they are going to die uh, in the next couple of weeks. And then we're just going to have the cocoons left over. And there's no real solution to remove the cocoons, unfortunately. They are just so impossible to see from the eye. Um, so there's not a whole lot that we know um, that'll help reduce them. I will say I did read um, uh, the Connecticut Department of Agriculture has a really helpful article that they just put out, I want to say a month ago, maybe a couple of weeks ago, where they mentioned this idea of tilling uh, at the right time. So if you can till um, probably about mid-June, uh, that'll help destroy their habitat where the juveniles might be um, hatching from. And you might be able to kill some of the population, again, destroying their habitat and also just injury from tilling, um, which might be helpful. But in the meantime, there's really, there's not a whole lot we can do. Um, maybe sit with it and cry. Um, it's frustrating, I know. I can save you from that one. <laughs> Uh, I a lot of people in the chat asked about controlled burns, knowing that solarization is effective. Um, we had a few questions about burns, both in an open environment um, and in in beds. Yeah, so controlled burns um, is sort of a, tr a tricky subject. And so, if we're thinking about the earthworm biology, uh, where these are, where the earthworms are, they're in the first couple of inches of the soil layer. And soil is really good at being insulative. So even if there is a prescribed burn, if, even if there's a controlled burn in an area, um, the worms, while they can't burrow as far as a common nightcrawler, they can still burrow under the soil pretty well. Uh, so oftentimes completely unaffected. Um, so it's, it's really tricky. I think research is still ongoing. So this might not be currently up to date, but my thought is that it, it probably would not work well um, just because of how insulative the soil is uh, protecting them from the temperatures of burning. Are there any, another one I'm seeing in the chat is things to add to the soil. Are there, has there been any research or any testing done of sort of adding nutrients back into the soil? Anything effective? Um, great question. Am I still here? Sorry, my um, computer just freaked out for a sec here. Um, yeah, so as far as additions to the soil goes, there's uh, an interesting conversation uh, about a lot of different additives, but unfortunately, none of them have been approved uh, as um, worm killers. And so some folks might say the saponins work really well. Some folks are talking about biochar um, or diatomaceous earth. And so if you find that these things work for you, Okay, um, but there's nothing that I can recommend, uh, and there's certainly nothing that's approved for um, the actual vermicide um, on the market right now. So maybe research is ongoing. I know that there's folks uh, at the University of Wisconsin that are looking into these kinds of things, these additives, and I'm hopeful that they'll find something that'll be productive. But uh, until then, there's nothing that I know uh, that is effective against jumping worms, unfortunately, for additions. Yeah, I would definitely caution people on trying all kinds of things that they might read about on the internet, because if you're killing jumping worms, you're also killing a lot of other things. So we really need to try to find something that's more selective, and it may not ever come around. It's going to be very difficult to find something that will control worms that doesn't control a lot of other organisms in the soil. And 
it's not a good idea to practice home chemistry or to just, you know, find something on the internet and do it. You know, somebody asked about biochar and diatomaceous earth. Those have both been tried by UVM and found to have really no, no effect. So, you know, don't, don't do your own research. Let, let others try to do it where, you know, they can do it with some sort of um, level of, of scientific uh, management of the, the situation so we can tell if something really does work. Thank you for that answer. For people who are, let's say, growing food or producing in their soil, uh, and I'm curious if this is a different question, is it worth adding more nutrients back into the soil, not to experiment on, you know, reducing the worm population, but more to um, improving the soil quality? I would say, yeah. I think, especially if you're growing crops um, and, and you want the crops to do well, it seems, um, you know, adding things like healthy compost or any kind of additives that you've been adding to your, your soils. Um, you are going to be feeding the jumping worms, but at the same time, you're also providing nutrients back into those soils, back into your plants. So the jumping worms are going to take some of the nutrients and, and that's okay. Uh, again, we're, we're not trying to eradicate, we can't eradicate them. So it's really just learning how to live with them. Um, but you're really just allowing that and those extra nutrients to go to the plants or the crops that need them. So I would say, yeah, if this is if this is the situation you're in, um, yes, you will be and you will end up feeding the worms, but you're also going to end up having productive crops uh, or a best shot at it. So I would say, yeah. Thank you so much. And I'll I'll ask one final question. Uh, I we saw this many times in the chat, but I'll I'll end us on a what can I do note. If we suspect or have sent a photo of jumping worms and maybe we're waiting for a response from the state or, you know, uh, someone was mentioning the emotional impact of feeling like you've got jumping worms and you don't know what to do. Can you reiterate for us the first one or two steps that people can take? Yeah, so we have really great resources on our website. Um, I honestly can't even tell if I'm sharing my screen anymore, but um, if you, <laughs> I am, oh great. Okay, so uh, if I go back here, yeah, so this is uh, our website. Um, and so if you type in Maine Forest Service or um, the DACF jumping worms, this will come up. And we have uh, our identification keys on this webpage. There's also a lot of great resources on this webpage as well. Um, and so if you are able to get a worm, uh, if you have a hand lens, we're, again, we're checking for the setae or the hairs that are on them. We're looking for that clitellum if you can see it. Um, and those are really going to be uh, factors that's going to help you identify jumping worms. And once you have an eye for it, uh, you look at enough pictures online, you you can kind of tell pretty quick whether or not you've got a European earthworm or a red wiggler or a, um, a jumping worm. So using resources available to you is the fastest way to get relief if, if we're not responding uh, fast enough. But yeah, sending in that report form is a great way to start. But if you're in that waiting period, um, just try to use resources to, to see if you can identify it for yourself. And if you can't, that's okay. We will get to you eventually um, and we will help you figure it out. Um, and I can't remember if I mentioned it, but please send us photos. If you send a report and it doesn't have photos in it, we, we can't look at anything to help you identify that. So uh, send a report, but please, please send us good photos so that we can give you a definitive answer. Yeah, I, I just want to um, touch on that as well. We've had so many reports that it is taking time to go through them. So we only have one person that's going through them and and she could use a lot of help. But, you know, at this point, um, please be patient. It's not going to make any difference. Um, if you have them, you have them. If you don't, you don't. The uh, adult worms are going to be dying soon anyways. And, you know, we will get back to you as soon as we get through all of the over 300 reports that we've had. And again, you know, they're pretty much probably in every county now. We haven't had reports in every county, only 14, because we did add, add a rustic recently. And, you know, so you're not alone. I did, and someone else also did put in the link to the emotional um, concern about jumping worms resource that the University of Minnesota has put out. And um, so take a look at that. I know that a lot of people are, kind of depressed about these, but unfortunately they're here and we need a lot more answers and research and we just gonna have to be patient. 
And thank, thank you, you, Brittany, so for doing a great yeah. job. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. Gary. Thank you, Brittany. And thank you, Gary. And thanks to everyone who joined us tonight. I really appreciate that note that you ended on that we're all a community managing this together. Um, we have recorded this lecture, so we'll post it up on our website if you want to share it. I feel that uh, the community educational spread is essential and, and is a part of why so many people are here tonight. Um, they'll be found on our website. And I will also download the chat because Gary did some incredible question answering while you're giving your presentation, Brittany. So I want to make sure that people have the opportunity to read those answers. Uh, if you want to continue the conversation and you're local to Bath, we're going to have an in-person gathering for any land trust, community gardeners, or home gardeners at the Freight Shed in Bath, a community learning conversation about gardening with jumping worms. Like we said, there's so much we don't know, but there's we don't have to learn it all alone. Um, so we'll sort of share the story of well, how we found them in our community garden, and all participants will have the opportunity um, to share best practices and strategies as we move forward with jumping worms, which is something we are now accepting. Uh, this will very much be community-led, not expert-led like tonight, so we'd love to have your voice there if you can join us. That'll be next Tuesday, October 24th at the Freight Shed and Bath, 6 p.m. So that concludes our evening. It's seven o'clock, everyone. I will be hanging out for a couple more minutes just to download the chat, uh, but have a wonderful night. And thank you again so much for joining Kelps this evening. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone.